Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Thursday, everybody. Almost the weekend. Two more days to go. I hope you're having a good one. Now, before we move into the main updates, to supplement yesterday's coverage of the stock market, the CSI 300 index closed down 0.6% on Wednesday, taking its three-day loss to more than 3%, the most since the. 31st of January, the Shanghai Composite Index briefly tumbled below the key 2,900 level. Chen Zunde, fund manager at Guangdong Fund Investment Co, expressed yesterday on the news, "Quote: There is some pessimism due to the fact that the plenum did not provide many concrete reasons to be more upbeat. There is a bit of panic, but the sell-off could also be largely associated with fund flows." End quote. This is more or less consistent with our observations yesterday. Now for the main stories related to the economy. According to new numbers published yesterday, Guangdong, China's largest economic province and the heart of the powerhouse, which is the Pearl River Delta, has reported only 3.9 percent growth in its gross domestic product for the first half of the year, falling behind the national average of 5 percent. Guangdong contributed 11.76 percent of the country's GDP last year and is seen as one of the most dynamic regions of the country, with only the Yangtze River Delta, which cradles Shanghai. Coming close, according to the official data report, the continuing slowdown in the real estate industry was the main factor behind the slowdown. Real estate investment fell by 16.8 percent in the first six months, a steeper decline than the 10 percent in 2023. Chinese financial media outlet Yizhai reports that the quote impact of the real estate slump on Guangdong's economy is significant. In quote, in 2022 and 2023, the sector accounted for more than 30 percent of the province's fixed asset investment. In the first half of 2024, real estate investment was only 600 billion yuan, 81 billion U.S. dollars, equivalent to 9.03 percent of its GDP, down from 15.6 percent in 2020. Weaker than expected consumption also contributed to Guangdong's slower GDP growth. The province's total retail sales grew only 1.2 percent year on year, compared with the national growth rate of 3.7 percent and 5.8 percent growth in 2023. What is concerning is that this province doesn't rely much on state support, comparatively speaking, as much as other provinces for growth due to its potent private industry. Thus, the slowdown in growth and plunge in consumption, as well as building investment, reflects the underlying dynamics in the broader economy. Guangdong is also a manufacturing and export powerhouse, which brings us to the next development. In a piece published this week, the U.S.-based Wall Street Journal writes that, quote, "As Western companies quake at the latest onslaught of cheap Chinese goods, a similar drama is playing out in China, where manufacturers are struggling as Beijing boosts industrial capacity without stimulating new demand." End quote. It's worth noting a few points made by the outlet in the piece. With the property bubble that powered growth for years deflating, Beijing has been funneling investment into manufacturing, yet taking a few significant steps to boost consumption that would soak up the resulting supply. Quote, the resulting overcapacity means that prices that producers charge at the factory gate have been in free fall for almost two years. That is dragging the overall economy closer to outright deflation, and eating into earnings. In quote, around a quarter of the companies listed in mainland China are now unprofitable, compared with seven percent a decade ago. But such pressures go beyond targeted new industries to machinery, electronics, and software. Angang Steel told shareholders in a filing that its loss for January through June would be around 370 million U.S. dollars, almost twice the loss for the same period last year. It said the whole industry was under pressure from tumbling prices and weak demand. Quote, to compensate for weak domestic sales, Chinese companies have turned to exports, which were up 8.6 percent in June from a year earlier. But those exports have put pressure on jobs and industries in other countries. As a result, trade barriers to China are growing. In quote, this of course will be very familiar to regular viewers. Earlier this week, we saw that Logan Wright, a partner at Rhodium Group in the U.S., argued, quote, "An investment-led growth model can only go so far because ultimately there has to be demand somewhere. There will be a reckoning within China." In quote, 
The Wall Street Journal piece argues that Beijing routinely directs capital through subsidies, tax breaks and state-controlled banks and investment funds to favoured sectors. We did a deep dive into this a few weeks ago. That gives companies an incentive to pile into these sectors and increase production. Compared with the beginning of 2022, Chinese banks' real estate loan books are flat. Loans to industry have swelled more than 60%, however. Louise Lo, chief economist for China at Oxford Economics, responding to the piece, argued this week that ultimately, by boosting supply more than demand, China is generating growth today, but at the cost of growth tomorrow. Quote, whatever you are producing now, you will not produce in the future. End quote. Next up, and speaking of Guangdong before, this week Ukraine's foreign minister, Kuleba, met with China's top diplomat, Wang Yi, in Guangzhou, the provincial capital of Guangdong. The Chinese readout for the meeting was fairly boilerplate. Commentators point out, however, that the Ukraine readout makes some interesting points. According to the Ukraine readout, the foreign minister, quote, restated Ukraine's established position that it is ready to engage the Russian side in the negotiation process at a certain stage, when Russia is ready to negotiate in good faith, but emphasized that no such readiness is currently observed on the Russian side, end quote. He also told the Chinese side, quote, Ukraine has recently started negotiations on joining the European Union, and this decision is irreversible. Russian aggression is not only an obstacle to Ukraine's development, but also hinders international stability, the development of good neighborly relations, and in particular, the development of trade between China and Europe. End quote. A very subtle threat. Ukraine President Zelensky, speaking to reporters, described the visit of the Ukrainian official at this level, quote, the first in many years, and this is good. There is a clear signal that China supports the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. End quote. Some commentators, perhaps prematurely and over-optimistically, argue that Beijing may be considering coming into pressure for peace. Yun Sun, the director of the China program at the Stemson Center, a foreign affairs think tank in Washington, argues that Beijing may be calculating that the time is right to step in, partly based on a belief that Ukraine may be more realistic about how the war might end, telling the US-based New York Times, quote, The Chinese wanted to play the role of peacemaker, and they weren't able to before because the timing was not mature in that Ukraine still believed that it could prevail in winning the war on its own terms. End quote. Natalia Butreska, an expert on Ukrainian-Asian relations at the Kiev-based New Europe Center, a foreign policy think tank, similarly argues this week that in Ukraine there has been a growing understanding that peace talks without China's participation, quote, will not be meaningful. End quote. Adding, quote, China is a country that can push Russia to engage in peace talks. End quote. However, all this could be wishful thinking as the war goes on. We will have to see. Japanese financial media outlet Nikkei Asia reports yesterday that Belarusian opposition group Bellpol obtained contracts, payment records and other information from multiple industry sources on transactions between companies in Belarus and China. According to these records, Shenzhen-based Green Cycle Energy received an order from Belarusian defense contractor Bell OMO holding for 3,000 components for the LAD-21T laser model on December 1st. The cutting-edge module is used to aim laser-guided bombs and missiles. The payment was made in Chinese yuan. The Shanghai branch of Russia's state-owned VTB bank was involved. We remember too, last week Chinese troops were involved in military exercises with Belarus near the Polish border something that didn't go unnoticed. Poland recently threatened to choke off a key Chinese rail export route to the European Union to slow escalating the migration crisis on its eastern border. US-based Bloomberg, citing unnamed sources, reports that Poland's president, Duda, used his state visit in Beijing in late June to link the issue of migration and freight transit on the Belarusian border. The number of irregular crossings from Belarus into Poland has dropped significantly since. Konrad Poplowski from the Center for Eastern Studies, a Warsaw-based think tank, argues that Warsaw's so far successful leverage of a strategic vulnerability against China can serve as a lesson for policymakers. 
He argues that Beijing is the EU's, quote, trade partner, but also a competitor and systemic rival, end quote, and can change tack if the bloc is, quote, ready to bear economic costs when its core interests are at stake, end quote. Next up, Chinese espionage in the US. But just quickly, if you're enjoying or getting some value from today's episode, I have a huge favor to ask. It's just to hit the like button, and if you haven't done so already, subscribe and hit that bell notification. It's just a couple of clicks of the mouse, but it's a huge help for me and the channel, and it means it can be shown to new people. Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are also in the description below for those who want to help keep the channel financially sustainable. It is just me making these episodes open and free six days a week, and I hope to continue you doing that with your support. Thank you so much, everybody. Yesterday saw the unsealing of a federal indictment accusing a Floridian man of operating for years as an agent of the Chinese government, alleging that he provided information on political dissidents and American people and organizations to a Chinese intelligence service. Federal agents on Saturday accused Ping Li on charges of criminal conspiracy and operating as an unregistered foreign agent. The indictment describes numerous contacts Li is alleged to have had with a Chinese intelligence intelligence officer based in the city of Wuhan. Li is an American citizen who emigrated from China. He has lived in the U.S. for 30 years. He worked for Verizon for more than 20 years and most recently worked for Infosys, an India-based information technology company. Here is the U.S. Department of Justice indictment document. Quote, the indictment alleges that Li was a U.S. citizen who immigrated to the U.S. from the PRC. At various times, Li worked for a major U.S. telecommunications company and an international information technology company. From as early as 2012, Li allegedly served as a cooperative contact working at the direction of officials of the Ministry of State Security to obtain information of interest to the PRC government. Lee obtained a wide variety of information at the request of the Ministry of State Security, including information concerning Chinese dissidents and pro-democracy advocates, members of the Falun Gong religious movement and U.S.-based non-governmental organizations, and to report that information to the Ministry of State Security. Lee also provided the Ministry of State Security with information obtained from his employer. Lee used a variety of anonymous online accounts for the purpose of communicating with the Ministry of State Security and traveled to the People's Republic of China to meet with the Ministry of State Security. End quote. With that in mind, we end today's video with the findings of a recent survey report from the US-based think tank Center for Strategic and International Studies called Espionage in the United States Since 2000 which we're now quoting selected excerpts from directly. Chinese espionage is undertaken in pursuit of China's strategic objectives. This is a change from the past where commercial motives were often equally important, but commercial espionage by both private and government entities remains a feature of Chinese spying. When Xi Jinping took office, one of his first acts was to repurpose and reorient China's collection priority to better serve long-term goals, clamping down on what appeared to be collection by some PLA units intended for personal gain, i.e. stealing commercial technology and providing it to private companies for cash or favors, as part of his larger campaign against corruption. Of the 224 incidents, we found that 69% were reported after Xi took office. It should be noted that the incidents of Chinese espionage far outnumber those by any other country, even Russia. The long-term cost to the American economy and national security cannot be precisely measured, but estimates run into the billions of dollars for commercial and technological espionage alone. Chinese espionage also created immeasurable damage to national security with the theft of weapons technology, including nuclear weapons, test data. In the last few years, China has added the theft of massive quantities of personal information, political coercion, and influence operations to its espionage activities. It is worth noting that while nationality is a predictive factor for espionage, ethnicity is not. Chinese nationals who come to the U.S. to work or study are a fertile ground for recruitment. They often intend to return to China or have close family members resident in China, making them more susceptible to coercion. In contrast, Americans of Chinese descent are very unlikely to be recruited. The espionage problem is the result of the increasingly hostile policies of China's ruling Communist Party. Hacking is China's preferred mode of espionage. 
we found so many instances of reported Chinese cyber espionage, 104 in the last 10 years. But hacking is not the only form of spying, and China uses traditional methods of agent recruitment, usually sex or money, as well as unconventional approaches, such as buying property next to a military or research facility. While this list is not complete, certain patterns emerge. For those cases where we could identify the actor and intent, we found 49% of incident directly involved Chinese military or government employees, 41% were private Chinese citizens, 10% were non-Chinese actors, usually US persons recruited by Chinese officials, 46% of incidents involved cyber espionage, usually by state-affiliated actors, 29% of incidents sought to acquire military technology, 54% of incidents sought to acquire commercial technologies, and 17% of incidents sought to acquire information on US citizen agencies or politicians. Here ends the direct quote and today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a great Thursday, and I will see you all tomorrow.